Good afternoon. Joining me to my right is the woman who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persa Kelly. To her right, we welcome back the Department of Health's Communicable Disease Service Director, Dr. Ed Lifshitz. Great to have you both. To my left, another guy who needs no introduction, the Superintendent of the State Police, Colonel Pat Callahan, Chief Counsel Paramal Garg, Aliana Post, and a cast of thousands. First and foremost, and with the heaviest of hearts, our thoughts and prayers are with the family of this guy, Kyle Mullen, the Navy SEAL candidate from Manalapan who tragically died while in training in San Diego on Friday. He represented the very, very best of our state and our country. I can't tell you, he was a guy that my family knew remotely by reputation. I never had the honor of meeting them to the best of my knowledge, but he was a legend um, in, in athletics, in all walks of life. He was just 24 years old. I will be directing all state flags to be lowered in his honor and memory more on that when we have a better sense of um, the way forward. I spoke with his mom this morning. She's just going through, as you can imagine, an unspeakable um, period uh, and just describing um, how special her guy was. He's got an older brother. Keep the whole family um, in your prayers. He was literally a legend. God bless you, Kyle. Before we get to the sort of big news for the day, I want to put a reminder out so it doesn't get lost. Tomorrow, the registration window will be open for the New Jersey Housing and Mortgage Finance Agency's $325 million Emergency Rescue Mortgage Assistance Program, or IRMA, E-R-M-A. Through IRMA, eligible homeowners can receive up to $35,000 to cover mortgage arrearages delinquent property taxes and other housing cost delinquencies for those who were negatively impacted by the pandemic, protecting homeowners from foreclosures and neighborhoods from being impacted. Free housing counseling will also be available to assist homeowners in applying for assistance, as well as guiding them through all available options and even working with their mortgage companies to get the best possible outcome. Again, the IRMA opens tomorrow, so I encourage you to visit the New Jersey Housing and Mortgage Financing Agency at njhousing.gov, that's njhousing.gov, and click the link for the Homeowner Assistance Fund, or you can call that phone number that's up there, 855-647-7700. Again, 855-647-7700. With that said, here is the announcement I know many of you have been waiting to hear. Because of the dramatic decline in our COVID numbers, effective Monday, March 7th, the statewide school mask mandate will be lifted. Additionally, we will lift the statewide mandate in all child care settings. Later this week, we will extend the public health emergency by 30 days to allow for this mask mandate to continue until then and then be responsibly lifted. As we have with other similar actions, we're announcing this with plenty of advance notice for our schools and child care settings, for our students and their families, our educators and support staff to determine how this will impact them and to finalize any steps they may need to make in preparation. Masking continues to be an important tool to prevent the spread of COVID and should be used in many circumstances. In the coming weeks, the Department of Health will also be updating, under Judy's leadership, will also be updating its guidance to help school districts make the best decisions as to whether and when masks uh, should be worn. I must thank the overwhelming majority of students, parents, administrators, educators, and support staffers who stood tall as role models ever since our schools returned to in-person instruction by wearing your masks day in and day out without problem or protest. You truly represent our highest New Jersey values of selflessness, community spirit, collective responsibility, looking out for others. You are the reason why we're ready to take this step. A couple of things to note. We are removing the statewide requirement that all students, educators, staff, and visitors wear masks while indoors, again, effective uh, March 7th. 
we are not removing the ability of individual district leaders to maintain and enforce such a policy within their schools or any private child care provider from maintaining such a policy within their business should community conditions require. Likewise, any student, educator, or staff member, or visitor who chooses to continue masking up while indoors may freely do so. And we expect that schools will take swift disciplinary action against those who may try to demean or bully anyone who chooses to wear a mask. We will not tolerate anyone being put down by exercising their choice to mask up. We can responsibly take this step given the continuing drop in new cases and hospitalizations from Omicron and with all the evidence projecting a continued decline over the coming weeks. And we are also buoyed by the continued growth in vaccinations and the expectation that the vaccines will be made available to children under the age of five in early March. And we strongly encourage parents of school-aged children to have your child vaccinated. Additionally, although I was quoted as saying it's not the 4th of July, I admit, but early March traditionally means the weather starts to warm up at least a bit, and Pat, you'll make sure that that happens, which will give schools a little bit more flexibility to increase ventilation, be more creative with that, and further decrease the risk of COVID spread. And perhaps most importantly, this is a huge step back to normalcy for our kids. As I mentioned last week, I had the honor of being with Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchison on Meet the Press. And by the way, alongside Governor Hutchison, I'm honored to help lead the National Governors Association. We're not, and we've said this many times here, we're not going to manage COVID to zero. We have to learn how to live with COVID as we move from a pandemic to the endemic phase of this virus. To be sure, we've known this for a long time, and we are optimistic that given the decreased severity of this new variant and the continued increase in vaccinations that we are finally nearing this inflection point. I've said many times that we would act deliberately in all we do in response to the pandemic. The mask mandate has been part of a many layered approach to being able to safely keep our schools open because we know that remote learning is an inadequate substitute for learning in person. We have tried, as we've said many times, to meet the moment, not to undershoot it, putting lives at risk, or to overshooting it, only adding to mental health and stress that we know exists up and down the state. And the numbers bear out the effectiveness of this approach. You can see here over the past number of weeks. Yes, the overall rates of infection among all students and educational staff, regardless of where that exposure occurred, has dropped off significantly over the past month. And by the way, this is not with regard specific only to in school. This is all COVID as it relates to students and staff. But since the beginning of the 2021-22 school year, there have been roughly, as you can see, not roughly, exactly 2,635 student cases, 503 staff or educator cases, and those were all spread across 465 specific uh, outbreaks. Keep in mind, by the way, 2,635 students out of 1.4 million students, um, 465 outbreaks out of about 3,500 school buildings. While we didn't want to keep any mandates in force for a moment longer than necessary, at the same time, the last thing we wanted to do was to pull back too early, endanger our students and their families or educators and staff, and make it more likely that outbreaks would force schools to close. Again, as I said last week, every time you think you've got this thing figured out, it humbles you. But we are confident that four weeks from now, we will be able to be at the point with regard to the statewide school mask mandate that we have announced. One of the things that I am most proud of, and Judy and her team, including Ed, deserve a lot of credit here, a lot of the credit. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of uh, in our overall pandemic response is that we're the state that did, that did not ride the roller coaster on again, off again, two steps forward, one step back restrictions that many other states have been through. I think in every case across the board, we have not re-implemented any significant restrictions after them been limited. Decisions like these, 
balancing public health with the need to get back to some semblance of normalcy are not easy. If we are to err, I would much rather be it on the side of protecting public health. There are issues that are and must always remain above politics. The health and safety of our residents, and especially our kids, is not just among them, but it is arguably the most important of them. So again, Monday, March 7th, the indoor masking requirement in our schools and daycare settings will be lifted. Now, with all of that said, let's quickly get to the rest of the numbers for today. First, let's look at the numbers of newly recorded cases. We see the rate of transmission. Judy, how nice is it to see 0 0.5 something for seven, seven in a row there. Um, it's holding steady um, at well below one. And the case numbers are down by more than 50% from where they were a week ago. A quick note, by the way, one month ago today on January 7th, we reported more than 39,000 cases with a positivity rate of 34%. That's one month ago. And as we cross over to the numbers in our hospitals, we see these numbers continue to tail off as well. Overall, hospitalizations have dropped by another one-third over the past week. Again, going back one month ago today, we had more than 5,700 people uh, in the hospital, uh, and we were four days from our Omicron peak. We also see the ICU numbers and ventilator counts tailing off considerably, although we know that some of those numbers are due to that number on the bottom now, the numbers of deaths sadly reported by our hospitals. Those are not confirmed. Again, those are the numbers they report each of the previous 24 hours. And subsequently, these are the newly confirmed deaths. God bless each and every one of them. Again, those aren't, I'll just pick today. That is not 15 people who passed today. Those are the numbers of deaths, Ed, that have been confirmed today, regardless of when they occurred. Although increasingly and sadly, as we've gone through this pandemic, the team has picked up a lot of expertise and are much more quickly um, confirming these deaths. So these are, I'm sure, overwhelmingly uh, from recent times. Finally, in terms of numbers, here are this morning's vaccination numbers, which, as I mentioned, are a significant reason why we can now prepare for the expiration of the indoor mask mandate in our schools. With more than 90 percent of eligible residents having received a first dose, we are among only six other states to have reached this milestone, according to the CDC. But again, while all the signs continue to point in a positive direction, we have to keep it that way. None of us should be taking anything for granted, and none of us should be ready to let up. We are moving steadily toward a return to a real sense of normal, and let's get there. Aliana, can you go back to the booster slide, or the vaccination slide? There's one thing that I think, Judy, I'd be remiss, and we'd be remiss, and you'd, you'd be mad at me if I didn't say it. The booster penetration continues to be way lower than it needs to be. And this is not, folks, by the way, there's an interesting piece this morning that I read. This does not break down on political lines like we've seen, sadly, the, the original courses have broken down on political lines. This is the 49% the, the in our state who aren't boosted, and by the way, we're a lot better than most of America, is, looks a lot like our state. And I, I'm not sure I, I can understand yet why the, the lack of uptake is not, is not stronger and better, but it is what it is, and that's the one area I think you'd want me to say we need a lot more progress. Okay, thanks, Eliana. So, as we get back to normal, we have to always remember those who will not be there with us when we do. And here are a few more of their stories. Today, we honor two members in the same family. I alluded to this last week. Vincent Apicelli Sr., he's on the left, the guy on the right, and Vincent Apicelli Jr. They both lived in the West, bless you, West Belmar section of Wall Township in Monmouth County. They were 81 and 52, respectively. Vincent Sr., by the way, I'm, I'm, I found out about this because I knew this barbershop was an institution, and I read about it in the paper. Vincent Sr. was the longtime owner and operator of the Belmar Barbershop, the Main Street, Main Street considered an institution in the community. Vincent learned his barbering skills while in the United States Navy. His loss left a huge hole not just in his family and among his friends, but in the fabric of downtown Belmar, where nearly everyone knew him, and at one time or another, he had cut nearly everyone's hair. He passed on December 28th. 
Vincent Sr. met his wife of 53 years, Ellen, where else? At the barbershop. Uh, though she admitted she's probably the one person whose hair he never cut. They had three children together, daughters Tina and Kim, and a son, as you know, on the, on the right, Vincent Jr., who everybody called Vinny. Ten days ago, on June 29th, Vinny passed away from complications of COVID. His battle against the virus made harder as he was also undergoing treatments for stage four multiple myelo myeloma cancer. He was just as recognizable a figure locally as his father was, a gifted baseball player in his youth. He was described as having a cannon for an arm and could hit the ball a mile. He spent hours on the diamonds in Wall Township as a volunteer and umpire with the North Wall Little League. In addition to his mom and sisters, Vinny also left behind his three children, two daughters of his own, Alana and Ashley, and his son, Little Vinny. He also leaves countless friends. So I had heard about Vincent Apicelli Sr. and spoke to daughter Tina, who lives in Mississippi, and she mentioned to me at the time that her brother was battling this. And as we were getting ready to honor the father uh, last week, sadly we got word that Vinny died, and then I spoke to his mom and Vincent Sr.'s wife, Ellen, and you can imagine how busted up they all are. May God bless both Vincent and Vinny, and we thank them both for the tremendous contributions they made to their community, in Vincent's case to our country. May God bless each of their souls and watch over the families they leave behind. And today we also remember East Brunswick's Susan Sue Tissaker, who passed from COVID at the age of 78. For many in Trenton, Sue will be remembered as a longtime chief of staff to my friend, our friend State Senator Sam Thompson. But her career in public service reaches back across nearly 40 years, and it began in service as an educator. Sue left the classroom to enter the insurance industry and would own and operate her own agency. That change in career would open up numerous new doors within the community. She would go on to become the East Brunswick Regional Chamber of Commerce uh, pr president, the chair of the East Brunswick Zoning Board of Adjustment, and a commissioner on the Middlesex County Board of Elections. In political life, Sue was the founder of the Middlesex County Republican Women's Club and served as the president of it for over 10 years. She would also serve over time as the East Brunswick Republican Municipal Chair, as a regional vice chair of the Middlesex County Republican Organization, and as treasurer of the New Jersey Federation of Republican Women. Sue shared the last 35 years with her husband, Donald Katz, with whom I had the great honor of speaking last week. She also leaves her brother, Michael, and her sister, Anne, among other family. And Donald told me some great stories, including about their wedding. We know that God has blessed her for a lifetime of service to our community and our state's civic dialogue. She will be missed by memory. God, may God bless her memory and Donald and the family she leaves behind. And by the way, God bless in all of the, every one of the roughly now 32,000 New Jerseyans we've lost. May God watch over each and every one of them and their families. Next, I want to give a shout out to this guy, Alex Habaz, the owner of the logistics company Fleet Distribution Centers. For nearly 20 years, Alex and Fleet Distribution Centers have provided warehousing and distribution services to numerous companies utilizing the ports of Elizabeth and Newark. With business growing at a rapid pace, Alex recognized the need to make a significant addition to his team and the Department of Labor's Return and Earn program helped him not only find that, that needed employee, but also help cover his onboarding and training costs. And that's and, and by the way, that the new worker also got a $500 signing bonus when they began, a valuable incentive for joining Alex's team. I had the opportunity to catch up with Alex last week, who, by the way, is as busy as ever to thank him for partnering with us through Return and Earn to help fleet distribution centers prepare for a strong and prosperous future. Check out their website. It is fleet3, the number 3, pl.com. fleet 3 pl Dot com. I asked Alex, by the way, if he had any advice. He said, yeah, you can market this program more. I can't believe how good it is, but I stumbled upon it. And I said, you know what, that's good advice. From the Department of Labor, by the way, to the Economic Development Authority, we've invested now nearly a billion dollars 
in the businesses we're going to rely on over the long term. These are truly innovative and winning partnerships. And I say the same about the many other partnerships that have carried our state throughout the pandemic and are now positioning us as we begin to return to a real sense of normal. And again, we'll take another big step forward in four weeks from today, March 7th, when the school mask mandate will be lifted. With that, please help me welcome the woman who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon. As the governor said, uh, the department will be developing guidance uh, that incorporates all aspects of safety in schools while the children are unmasked. We know that every parent wants to do what's best for their children. So there may be parents who will want their children to continue wearing masks, and we want to respect those decisions as well. School districts will also have the right to maintain a universal masking policy after March 7th, in the event of a school outbreak, it will be important for the districts to work with the local health department to determine what preventive measures are best for the children and the staff in their school. Also, last week, the department's Communicable Disease uh, Service issued uh, public health considerations for COVID-19 home-based self-tests. The recommendations from CDS provide updated guidance for local health departments and public health partners for reporting and interpreting self-tests uh, in order to determine public health actions. Testing, as you all know, is a critical component in tracking the spread of COVID throughout the pandemic. Home testing procedures are an easy and accessible alternative if you are feeling unwell or if you have been exposed. Over 640,000 at-home saliva test kits have been ordered through our at-home testing partnership with Vault. Also, the federal government is sending at-home tests to those who request them online at covidtests.gov or by phone at 1-800-232-0233. Home-based tests include those where the specimen is collected at home under the supervision of a healthcare provider and processed in the lab, um, like the vault saliva test, uh, as well as those over-the-counter antigen self-tests like Binex Now, which are performed by individuals without any professional interaction. While home-based tests offer accessible testing and produce rapid results, these results may not be reported to public health authorities, which places the responsibility on the individual to self-isolate for the recommended period of time and notify their close contacts. Results from self-administered tests are also not included in the state's overall count of COVID cases, which makes it important that individuals who test positive on a self-test notify their health care provider or local health department if they do not have a provider and if they have concerns and questions to make sure they reach out to their health department or their primary care provider. Getting tested if you are not feeling well or may have been exposed to someone with COVID is a responsible thing to do, as is reporting your positive self-test results to a health care provider to ensure that you take the steps necessary to protect yourselves, yourself and those around you. I'm also reporting that there have been a total of 182 cases of multi-inflammatory syndrome in children, MISC, in New Jersey to date, including an additional seven reported cases since our last briefing. Five of the children are currently hospitalized. Parents should contact their child's doctor or clinic right away if their child is showing symptoms of MISC, such as an ongoing fever, plus more of the following, stomach pain, bloodshot eyes, diarrhea, dizziness or lightheadedness, skin rash, vomiting, or confusion. Not all children will have the same symptoms. Uh, please call a medical provider if your child is experiencing any symptoms that are severe or concerning to you. Additionally, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, VRBAC, is meeting on February 15th to consider emergency use authorization 
of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine for children six months through four years of age. And now moving on to the daily report, as the governor shared, our hospitals reported 1,910 hospitalizations of COVID-19 positive patients and persons under investigation last evening. At the state's veterans home since our last briefing, there have been five new cases among residents and one COVID-related death at the Menlo Park home. Our state psychiatric hospitals, we have one new case among residents in Trenton and one new case at Ann Klein. The daily percent positivity uh, as of February 3rd for New Jersey is 6.76%, the northern part of the state 5.08%, the central part of the state, 7.95%, and the southern part of the state, 9.22%. So that concludes my daily report. Please continue to stay safe. Let's get vaccinated, get boosted to protect ourselves, our family, our friends, and our children. Thank you. Judy, thank you for all. In the interest of time, we'll move it right along. We've got a big crowd with us today. Pat, any post-mortem on the storm on Friday? Any color on what's out there now and what do you got at the end of the week and any other matters you've got? Good to see you. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. Uh, with regard to Fridays and the Saturdays, we had uh, troopers handled 168 accidents, almost 400 motorist aids. Uh, we did have a couple uh, tractor-trailer accidents for those drivers that failed to heed the commercial travel restriction. Uh, that was lifted Saturday morning at 8.30, uh, and I have confirmed that those drivers were issued summonses for being in here against the uh, travel restrictions. Uh, as far as today, we're still watching uh, rain, sleet, and snow. Uh, concerned about the ground temperatures for tonight, uh, but DOT is doing a phenomenal job out there. Um, also looking at a possible cold front Friday and Saturday, which uh, hopefully doesn't bring with it any uh, precipitation. I just wanted to thank uh, CDC, HHS, and FEMA for their efforts on both the Galloway and East Orange testing sites uh, in supporting uh, our testing. Uh, and I'll just end with the acute care strike team that's in helping University Hospital uh, has about two more weeks left supporting University Hospital, and uh, we don't anticipate uh, extending that and uh <laughs> i hope we don't have to and there is the winter weather advisories across the state have all been lifted with the exception of uh, western bergen and western passaic counties which are in effect till three o'clock this afternoon anything at the end of the week or is it too early to tell me? It, it looks like it's going to be cold but as far as precipitation it looks like uh hopefully nothing to be concerned about okay um thank you pat for everything We'll start over with Matt. Before we do, um, unless Aliana tells me otherwise, we'll be back here a week from today at 1 o'clock. Uh, and as we've got things to report throughout the week, we'll find ways to get to you either virtually or on the road. With that, Matt, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor. So you're dropping the requirement for masks in schools, but what do you recommend students and staff do? And what can you say more about the timing? I know if, if I ask if uh, there was any political calculation, you'd dispute the premise of the question, but you know, <laughs> wh why March 7th? Why not the end of February? Why not March 15th? Um, and to be clear, I think I know the answer to this, but just to be clear, will school districts be allowed to actually ban masks in schools if they want to? I think the answer in the last one is no. It's the opposite. The state is lifting the masking requirement, but in the in the positive, as Judy said, if a district chooses to, uh, but we're not, we're not allowing anyone to ban anything. Um, your first question was, what would make you wear a mask or what? What, what do you recommend students and staff? Yeah, I, I'm, we wouldn't be doing this if we didn't recommend uh, that you could lift it, but you also, you, you have to know your own health situation. If you've got some, I would think, Judy, a comorbidity or if a district thinks that there's a particular outbreak in that community. Um, but it, it, all other things being equal, healthy child going to school, um, they're going without a mask on, on March 7th. But again, two things, you gotta reserve the right, as a, a district reserves the right to uh, keep something in place. And secondly, I think most importantly, an individual based on their own health uh, reserves that right and we cannot stigmatize a decision like that. Listen, we're trying to get, um, given all the unpopular decisions I made when 
politics was really on the front burner. I, I think we could, I would agree with you. We'll, we'll disavow the premise of the question. Uh, you, you're, you're, trying to, you're trying to get a whole bunch of data streams together and make the best call you can. Uh, and so it's a combination of cases, hospitalizations, positivity rate, rates of transmission all going dramatically in the right direction. Um, it is trying to project out what those data streams look like we weeks in, ahead of time. Um, it's acknowledging that vaccination rates continue to creep up among kids who are more recently eligible. Um, not as fast as we'd like, but getting slowly but surely. It's the acknowledgement Judy mentioned that the commission, the committee is likely to meet and approve vaccines for kids under five years old. So that combination has given us the sense that sort of plus or minus a month from now is the right time to do it. Again, we're, we're dealing with a pandemic. It's like dealing with mother nature. You do the best you can. Um, but, and as I said, it's humbled us so many times in the past, but this feels right to us. Thank you, Dave, you get, you get to bat second here. Thank you, Governor. Yes, I moved seats on account of the possible questionable uh, fire alarm that took place last week. Um, point of, uh, uh, this is not a question, but just to make sure I understand, it's daycare as well as preschool and schools, all yes. facilities for children. Yep. So um, what about, what would your advice be for colleges, universities, uh, community colleges, and so forth? Um, you mentioned the fact that bullying and teasing and uh, so forth would not be tolerated in schools if a kid or a member of the faculty or whoever in the school wants to wear a mask. Why not just decide this is a statewide mandate that's being lifted and end it for everybody so that we don't open the door to these different situations? I think I know the answer, but I'd like to get your sense of that. Um, if we're dropping the school mask mandates, what about the um, executive order that forbids people to return products at supermarkets? Apparently there's some question about this. Over the weekend, I was with someone who attempted to return an unopened tube of toothpaste to a supermarket and were told that because of your executive order they couldn't do this. Someone else reported they went to another supermarket and they could return a product, so could you please clarify that? And finally, what suggestions would you offer, and I know this is very important to you, Governor, in particular, to towns for St. Patrick's Day parades that will be coming up uh, in March, and also the occasional indoor celebration that you may be attending, and others as well. Um, should we cancel parades? I mean, uh, a lot of towns did cancel them for the last couple of years. Now that things look like they're going in the right direction, what would your sense be of that? Thank you. We'll start with the back and go forward. And again, I'm going to try to, let's all be as brief as we can. There's no reason to cancel them. Um, I, I still think you have to use your head if you're inside and you're with a bunch of people, Judy, whose vaccination status you don't know. Um, but uh, there's no reason whatsoever to cancel them. The last thing Callahan and Murphy are going to do, and by the, by the way, Judy, you too, uh, uh, and, and as well as Ed Olifschitz uh, at the end of the table there, we're not going to... No, we should go ahead. Be responsible, be smart, particularly when you're indoors, but by definition, a parade is outside. I thought we had dealt with the return products. Uh, someone raised that, uh, I think, quite smartly many, many months ago. Paramount? Yeah, the governor never issued any type of executive order on returning products to supermarkets. That was a law the governor signed in the opening weeks of the pandemic, and I believe we signed a law repealing that a number of months ago, but we can follow up with you offline. I believe that's no longer, and it has not been for a while. I think you can't mandate lifting it, Dave, for the reason you would guess is, uh, and Judy would want me to say this, I would think you've got a particular health issue, um, in, in particular, that you, you're going to want to uh, wear that mask, and, and mandating you to not wear it is, is not on. So that's the, that's the real reason. And again, I mentioned the district's ability to make a decision locally, depending on what the dynamic is in that particular community, for instance. In the uh, child care, I, I answered in colleges and universities. Um, my view is we can responsibly, we are making a statement today that inside of in education communities, 
that you can responsibly, we believe, a month from today, all other factors being equal, in other words, that you don't have a particular health issue or there's not a raging situation going on in your town or in your school, that you can take that step. Um, and I would think the same goes for colleges and universities. It, 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 again, Judy would probably want me to remind everyone of this. They are, by definition, a more vaccinated reality because they're older populations and they've not been more recently um, uh, become eligible. So that's the only wrinkle. Mike, is that you? Hey. Yes, good afternoon, Governor. Good Thanks. afternoon. Um, I, I believe in January there are almost 2,400 deaths from COVID, which I, I think is the highest point or highest number since May 2020. You know, keeping in mind that deaths can be a lagging indicator, did that give you any pause in lifting this uh, mandate? And if not, can you talk about why not? Now, I think also one of the slides you showed uh, showed uh, school cases rising in January. How did you account for that in, in reaching your decision today? Thank you. So um, January, uh, Ed, Ed uh, I don't want to overstep my bounds, so you should weigh in here. January, I mentioned what it looked like on January 7th. That might as well have been 10 years ago. I mean, it's, the, the numbers are dramatically different um, in both as it relates to schools, cases, hospitalizations. And sadly, deaths are a lagging, uh, are, are lagging indicator, Judy, right? They're, they're going to come in as the last sad, tragic data point in what a period in this pandemic uh, looks like. And so that's my... Is that, is that fair as it relates to losses of life? Thank you for that. Alex, is it just you back there or either of you guys asking questions? Fine. Just Alex? Okay. Alex, we should give you some respect given we, we uh, Pat arranged for a fire alarm to go off in the middle of your questioning last week. So, Well, it's Pat, so I'll forgive Pat. <laughs> for Dr. Livshitz, I'd like to ask, why is the school mask mandate being lifted one month from now? How do we know what conditions, for better or worse, are going to be in regards to COVID one month from now? Why not lift the mandate today if conditions are improving? For Commissioner Persicelli, I'd like to get your reaction to the controller's report that examined nursing homes that showed that 15 of the worst nursing homes in the state continue to operate without any repercussions virtually, including receiving millions and millions in Medicaid dollars. Is your department unable or unwilling to crack down on intransigent nursing homes. And I'd also like to ask you a clarification about something you mentioned before about the school mask mandate. You said that in the event of an outbreak, certain procedures might come into place. Is there any mechanism in the executive order or in the health department regulations to order masking in schools again on a district level if there is an outbreak reported or is that not in the regulations you have right now? And for you, Governor, I definitely would like to ask if this also means you might lift the mask mandate in state buildings, including at this briefing where we're all vaccinated, far apart, masked, whatever. And in general, when it comes to school masking, you've said very consistently over the course of last year into this year that you would be looking at the rate of vaccination amongst juveniles, among students to make your decision and now today, suddenly you're talking about case numbers and you're talking about hospitalizations. When did you change your metrics on when to lift the school mask mandate? And was it before or after legislators, including members of your own party, moved to try and limit your executive authority? And just in general, on that executive authority, you did say that you're also going to be extending the public health emergency. Why? Why not end that public health emergency at the end of this week, along with the mask mandate? And do you expect any sort of blowback from legislators, including from your own party, as you continue to extend this pandemic executive order. So I'll, I'll start, and Judy or Ed, if you want, want to weigh in as, as you see, and Ed, we definitely got to give, get our money's worth out of your being with us today. I, I, I'm just going to pr predict a, a little a preview, I should say, what Ed, I would bet, would say, which is we see numbers going dramatically in the right direction. Um, and having said that, it's February 7th. It's miserable outside. Um, we want to make sure we're going in the right direction. We're proud of the fact that we have not gone two steps forward and one step back. We don't want to start that now. A few more weeks uh, gives us more confidence in that respect. So that's, that's, that's and again, let me go through a few things here and, and we'll come back to what Judy or Ed adding. I don't know, uh, I don't know what the action is yet, but uh, I 
well, I, I feel I can confidently put words in Judy's mouth, but they're in my mouth as well. That report on the 15 nursing homes is unacceptable. So we're, 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 she and I and their teams are looking at uh, possible options on how to deal with that. Completely unacceptable. Um, no, the, the mandating a district is not part of this. Allowing a district is part of it. And that's the way we want to, that's the, 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 we think the right place to settle. Again, Judy and Ed can come in here. State buildings ma uh, masking, nothing to report now, but we started talking about that just generally this morning. So that's no news to make there. But at a certain point, if you really continue to think you're in the right direction, uh, you want to be able to um, keep taking steps. Most, most of what's left at this point, Alex, is federal. So trains, planes, buses, any health care setting, Judy, long-term care, that's all federal masking requirements. Um, the one really big one left is the state, our state buildings, and that's something that I'm, you can assume that we'll be looking at. No, rate of vaccination, uh, it, it isn't either or. It's a whole series of data points that we've been looking at, and that is one of them. And by the way, in the additional one, which is Judy referred to, the ex expectation that the federal committee would approve a vaccine for the under five. Um, they're meeting again when, Judy? They're February 15th. Feb, Feb 15th, so that's a week from tomorrow. Um, so there's not a change. It's just sort of, we, we always say this, there's a series of data points that we look at, data streams that we look at, and that's one of them. Yeah, the executive authority was not, uh, that's not a factor here. We had a good, I had a very good, discussion with legislative leadership, the Senate president and the speaker, Paramo Thursday night, that's all right. Uh, very, very good discussion as a general matter. I think we have all, including yours truly, we have all, um, again, we want to, when the dust, when the dust finally settles, we want to do a comprehensive, independent, smart post-mortem. And part of that is clearly did Judy, did I, did Pat, did we have the right tools at our disposal? Was the, was the um, balance proper among various branches of government? We are very much open to all of the above, and I think they've indicated they are uh, anxious to do that as well. So I don't know how, I, we, we have to at least let Ed say something here. Ed, how, how, how did I do and anything you want to add? Well, I, I think you hit the uh, nail on the head there, yes. While we do not have an entire crystal ball, I do not know for sure exactly where we're going to be in a month, certainly the past, the way that Omicron has surged through other countries, how we've seen it surge through New Jersey uh, with the warmer weather and other things coming, how we've seen things happen in the past, it, it is a reasonable assumption that cases will continue to decline, at least for the near future. I do want to add, you know, as we've been talking here about lifting the mask mandates and so forth, it doesn't mean that the virus is going away. Nobody's asked a question about endemicity or, or those sorts of things or what that might look like or what that might mean. But I do think it is important for people to realize that while it's appropriate to begin doing things like loosening up so that people can go about more normal lives, the virus will not have disappeared. It will still be around. People still need to make reasonable decisions and take reasonable protections, first amongst those getting vaccinated, also, sometimes wearing masks in appropriate situations, ventilation, all, all these other things that we've been talking about for years. So uh, we're certainly in a whole lot better place and the state was, uh, well, much, much better than two years ago and much better than a month ago. And we're heading in, in the right direction and that's all good news. And I hate to be kind of a little bit of the Pollyanna, but we do have to pay some attention to the fact that our actions do influence this virus going forward as well. Yeah, this is not a declaration of victory as much as an acknowledgement that we can responsibly live with this thing. Judy, is that fair? Yeah. Anything you want to add or are you good? I think it's important that we start operationalizing all of the techniques that we've uh, mandated over the past year into our daily lives so we can move fast, um, constantly responding or reacting, I should say, and hoping that people respond appropriately. Well said. Thank you for that. Sir. Sir, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Governor, what is your response to school superintendents who said they don't feel qualified to make health-related decisions at the district level and would prefer that the state make the rules? Doesn't this new mask guidance put the burden on them instead of the state? 
And uh, apologies if this is similar to an earlier question, but um, you said you're confident that COVID cases will continue to decline and we'll be able to lift the mask mandate and uh, specifically what models or information um, gives you that confidence? Yeah, on the latter, I've kind of, I've, I've answered that. So it's, it's our, the best of our abilities, most importantly with the medical experts, such as the two uh, folks to my right and other folks, just a, the stream of data that we think we can best project where that's headed. I, I would just say to the lo local superintendents who've done, by the way, across the board an outstanding job, uh, they are used to dealing with their local health authorities. Um, we're getting to the point, um, and Judy just used the word which I like a lot, operationalizing uh, some of the things we've been doing as a pandemic response now to be a part of how we figure out how to live with this thing. And that is at least, as, as far as we could tell at the moment, best done with their local uh, health authorities. And I have one more for you too. Real quick. Um, from our friend David Cruz, uh, the Senate President says he supports an effort to look at the Emergency Health Powers Act of 2005. Would you support having to get approval from the legislature to declare and maintain an emergency declaration? Yeah, again, don't be mad at me. I think I just answered that. We, we all want to look at this and figure out whether or not we have the right tools in our, at our disposal, whether or not it's the proper balance among branches of government, um, not just the Senate president, count me in. We want to have that uh, and, and really assess in the hopefully when the dust is settled, how many times have we said that, Judy, uh, that, uh, that, that the, those of us up here, as, as well as the legislative leadership, had that as, as precise and in, as in balance as possible. I can't see who's in the back. Please, yes. Hi. Um, yeah. Is the state going to provide guidance to schools for other COVID-related restrictions, such as quarantines and testing? Uh, do you see any obstacles to mask policies on the local level? Uh, you've mentioned vaccine rates as a reason for lifting the mandate, but only one in four children ages 5 to 11 is fully vaccinated. How is this a justification? Um, does visitors in schools include spectators at events? If not, when will that requirement be lifted? And for the commissioner, is the state concerned that their recommendation to follow CDC guidance uh, that says children and staff who are not boosted should quarantine if exposed will lead to more absences? Okay, I think I got most of that. Um, to the last question, as well as the first, there is guidance that will be that Judy and her team will be formulating over the next number of weeks. That'll be quarantining. Uh, it'll be you know, things like barriers, so social distancing, all the stuff that we know are in place. Is that fair to say? Exactly. Um, I think I understood you. It does apply to visitors. Is that was that your question? So does does that include spectators at sporting events, plays, and things like that? Yeah. I would, the answer is yes. Um, Again, I think I answered this from Alex. Vaccine progress is a data point, a data stream that we look at very carefully, but it's one of many. And, and it's not just progress where we know we need to make more, but it is also the fact that we are expecting the under five cohort to get to become eligible for a vaccine. Did I get most of what you said? Is that you good with that? OK, thank you. Daniel, how are you? Good. How are you doing, Governor? Good. Good. Um, any thoughts on, uh, this is off topic, uh, any thoughts on New York overtaking New Jersey uh, this month, uh, last month for sports betting and uh, predictions that they'll do better uh, than New Jersey for the Super Bowl? Uh, does New Jersey risk losing its the status as uh, the de facto leader of sports betting in the Mid-Atlantic? Um, Who do you we, like in the game, by the way? Uh, whatever team wins. <laughs> okay. Uh, whatever you do, don't go out on a limb. All right. You uh, previously mentioned... It's Rams by four, by the way, is the line. It's All right. right. <laughs> you previously mentioned potential action in your budget on taxes and affordability. What are those, and do you intend for taxes or spending to go down in the upcoming budget? Um, you touched on St. Paddy's Day, um, but that's in a month. The Super Bowl is in a few days, and uh, COVID, even though Omicron is getting better, it is still... Uh, a big presence. Is it safe to do pre-COVID celebrations of, of, for the Super Bowl? Uh, that's it. Thanks. Okay. I, I think we thought from moment one that assuming New York legalized sports betting, that it would take a chunk out of our, our book of business. That was always our expectation, and that's what's happening. You, and, and you, you have, and you know this because of the, the unique angle you have, you have countless folks who literally had been crossing the George Washington Bridge 
placing a bet inside of the four walls, maybe at the Meadowlands or in their car online, and going back to New York. That Presumably a good amount of that traffic will, will cease. That does not mean that we still won't have a very good book of business. And I think more importantly, we have uh, gone out of our way aggressively to try to attract as many of the jobs uh, related to that industry in New Jersey. And we've had pretty good success at that. It's basically a fintech business. New Jersey's kind of the fintech capital in America. A lot of middle and back offices are in New Jersey of the big Wall Street firms. And that's allowed us to piggyback off of that. No news on the budget other than um, affordability. Uh, first of all, I'm going to, I've committed to not raise taxes and we will not raise taxes. Can we find ways to make the state even more affordable as opposed to not just go up, but you can do some things to press them to go down? We, we, we hope we can. No news to make, but that's something we're constantly looking at. Judy, a year ago, it was a big part of our pattern, and I'm glad Daniel asked it. Again, this is a, like an indoor St. Patrick's gathering. Yeah, it, and Ed said this, it's still in our midst, so use your head. Use your head, right? If you're with people indoors, have fun. There's no reason to ban anything. Enjoy this thing. Um, Saint, whether it's Super Bowl, St. Patrick's Day, whatever it might be. But be smart about it. And that's, I think, the, what we can ask folks, right? Okay. Carly, is that you? Yeah, thank you, Governor. How, how are you? I'm doing well. Uh, the CDC is still recommending school masking. Um, why deviate from their recommendations now when New Jersey's been in lockstep with the agency during this pandemic? Um, and just to put a finer point on a question some other folks asked, some other folks asked um, why make this announcement today without any accompanying guidance from DOH or DOE that lays out how this decision will impact quarantine timelines, social distancing, and contact tracing? Um, what can we expect that guidance to say when it comes out, and when can we expect that guidance? Um, along with that, will there be any kind of mechanism to reinstate the mask mandate if cases, cases start to rise again, like we saw with Omicron? Um, and New Jersey is one of the few remaining states keeping the in-school mask mandate through this month. We're seeing Delaware follow suit today uh, through the end of March. Keeping in mind your position as the vice chair of the Democratic Governors Association, how much was your decision to lift the mandate influenced by the decisions of other governors across the country? And do you think your decision today will make it more difficult for other governors to justify keeping their mandates in place? Um, and then just one off-topic question. Uh, charter school groups have been critical of your administration's decision to block expansion requests, uh, and the DOE's planned charter school law study has been put off indefinitely. What do you plan to do about charter school expansion in your second term? Okay, so that is off topic. Um, here's the, the challenge. We have, and by the way, thanks to Judy's leadership, we have been in virtual lockstep with the CDC. Here's the reality, and I saw this up close last weekend in Washington with 39 or 38 other governors. This, and the, the, the experts should weigh in, this thing rages, goes up like it's going to go to the moon, this, this variant, and then it comes down. The fact of the matter is we got hit among the first handful of states. Our reality is dramatically different than a lot of other states right now because we were so early on. So this is one where we, we feel like we, we can responsibly, because we've gone through it first, we can responsibly take this step. The guidance, very simply, is because we've got time on the clock, and there's no reason. There's no. There's no reason that we have to have it ready for now. Judy has the luxury with with Ed and team to be able to war game this now over the next several weeks, right? Um, and that uh, more time on the clock on this um, is always good news. You, you have to leave any option on the table. Uh, I've said this many times. We've said it many times. If this thing takes a crazy turn six months from now, you've got to leave options on the table, and we do. Um, to what extent we, were we influenced by others? Is that was your question? Zero. Literally zero. We're influenced by the reality in the state right now. Obviously, we take, if there are best practices elsewhere, obviously the feds matter to us greatly, um, but this is being done um, because the collective we believe it is the right responsible thing to do in New Jersey. I, I don't understand, on, uh, you, you, you'll have to, Carly, at some point I'll have to ask you offline why all of a sudden there's this big buzz around uh, our posture on charter schools. It, it takes my breath away. Sometimes folks write the article before they bother to check the facts. 
um, I believe 23 charter schools requested renewal. Every single one of them was approved. I believe that's 20, something like 23,000 seats. Um, I believe, and I don't have all this exactly, but ballpark of the 23, 11, not just wanted a renewal, but wanted expansion, 11 of the 23. We approved six of the 11, uh, another plus or minus 1,000 seats. So the fact of the matter is we've, we have, for moment one, have said we're, we're not about labels. We want to make sure the, the, the data that we all make these decisions uh, on across the spectrum of schools, whether it's charter, district, magnet, uh, private, whatever it might be, that we're all reading from the same set of facts, um, but we're not into labels. If it's a, if it's a high quality, top performing school, regardless of what type of school it is, and we're getting our kids educated in, by the way, the state with the number one public education system in America, we're, we're not, you know, we're, we've never, ever, ever been hell no charters. We just don't get in. We're not in the middle of that. We call these things as we see them. And so for the life of me, I don't get it. But it is some folks have an agenda and they want to write about it and talk about it. And I will tell you, we do not. We want to educate kids the very best way possible in America. And that's what we're committed to. Okay. I got to get off the soapbox, Judy. <laughs> Judy, thank you. Ed, thank you. Pat, as always. Paramel, Aliana, the whole team. Ruth had the mic today. Um, big step. This is a big step. We believe it is a step that we can take responsibly, that the runway is a responsible runway in terms of time. Judy and team will be working on the guidance. And again, the more time they've got on the clock, the sharper and better that guidance will be and more consistent it will be with, the, with meeting that moment when we get there. Please get vaccinated. Please, please, please get boosted. Please, by the millions, you've done the right things, folks. Hats off to each and every one of you. We'll be back here a week from today at 1 o'clock. Thank you.